whatever's going through my heart, I just want to give it to you, and I want you to open my ears, open my heart for what you have for me. Tell God that right now. Tell him that. You don't have to say it out loud, but say it in your mind. I'm going to trust everybody said that. Now I want you to go ahead and stand up. I want you to find somebody that you have not yet said hi to and welcome them into the house of the Lord this morning. Welcome to Sunlight Today. Yes, we have a special birthday crown. So I know this morning um, when somebody asked him if we were going to be singing happy birthday, he said, I don't think so, but he was wrong. So if you will all join me. And let's sing him happy birthday this morning. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Happy birthday to you. Not my idea, not my idea. All right, well, let's go ahead and remain standing this morning, and if you will join us for a time of worship.
every Sunday morning the praise team comes in early. Practice is usually between 8.30 and 8.45. Don't have a lot of people come into the sanctuary during that time. We had someone come in this morning and after the practice was over, they came up to me and they said, you know, Pastor, I came this morning early because I felt a little dry. Just felt dry in my spirit. And I wonder how many others Come on Sunday morning and you're a little dry. Your soul needs something. Your spirit needs that refreshing shower that God can provide. And I thought there's a perfect, there's a perfect segue into prayer this morning. Just a few moments, the team is going to lead us in another chorus and we're going to open up the altars and we're going to invite you to come and pray. But I have to believe, looking at the list of people that we're praying for, that some are here this morning and you may be a little dry. You're going through something right now. Maybe you've had a, a, a medical procedure of some kind. Maybe you're going through some health issues right now. Maybe some things are going on in your family that nobody else knows about and you came to worship this morning. But if you're honest with yourself, you'd be saying, you know what, I'm here but I'm not, because I'm a little dry. And so in a moment, we're gonna open up the altar and allow you to come, pray for something that's on your heart, pray for one of the requests that I bring to you this morning. But I want this time to be a time of refreshing of our spirits, refreshing of our souls. And just allow the the rain and the freshness and the newness and the grace of God to just pour upon every one of us and fill us this morning. I ask that you would pray for Jonah Cole. Jonah was in a car accident this week. Car was totaled. Jonah is sore. Praise God. I want you to pray for Joyce Gerber's brother, Ernie, who is near death. They're praying for his salvation. They're praying that God will do something great in his life. Just ask that you would pray for Ernie and pray for the family. Ask that you would pray for, for Joyce's brother, Chris, who is in the hospital right now with other health issues. Ask that you would pray for Carol Sue Thompson as Carol is going through some health issues right now. I ask that you would pray for Melissa Pearson as she is also going through some health issues. And I know some of you have had procedures this week and you're probably here and you're saying, you know what, I, I, just, need, I just need a moment with God. So I'm asking that if God is speaking to you this morning, our altars are open. And I'm asking that those who may not be coming this morning to pray, that when they see people at the altar, that you will just fill the altar behind them and pray for them. Place your hands for them, put your hand out, whatever you need to do. But come and be refreshed this morning with the rain that God has for you. So as the team leads, our altars are open. Come.
And Lord, we surrender it to you. Lord, we, uh, we confess that many times in our life we carry around things that are not supposed to be carried around by us. You tell us we're not supposed to take things like, like fear and, and doubt and all of those things, Lord, that, that quite honestly we allow to creep into our minds and it, it takes over and it affects us. And when it affects us, Lord, it, it causes us to be dry. And Lord, if we were honest with ourselves, there would probably be too many times where we would say, Lord, I'm dry. I just need you to come upon me. I just need you to just pour your, your spirit out upon me, Lord. And refresh me and renew me. And I pray this morning, Lord, that that is exactly what took place in people's hearts and people's minds, Lord, in their lives. As they came to you and, and poured their heart out to you, Lord, that you refreshed them, re renewed them. Lord, we, we lift up those who are at the altar this morning, whether they are here for, for a request that has been mentioned or they are here for something that is going on in their own minds, Lord, in their own hearts, their own life. I just pray, Lord, that you would just come upon them right now and they would sense your touch they would sense your power just filling them. And Lord, that whatever it is that they brought to you this morning, it's just taken away and you are going to do that for them. I just pray that for them right now. We do lift up those that we mentioned this morning. We are thankful, Lord, that you protected Jonah. And Lord, that you have brought him through this accident relatively unscathed. Still has a lot of bruises and bumps and sores, but Lord, we just pray that you would be with him and bring healing to him quickly through those times. We lift up Joyce's family to you as we lift up her brother Ernie to you and just ask, Lord, that, that even in these last moments that you will speak to him and he will cry out to you and Lord, that you will accept him and Lord, he will accept you into his life. Pray for him right now. We pray for our brother Chris as he is going through some medical issues right now and just ask, Lord, that you would be with him and that you would bring healing to his life. We lift up Carol Sue Thompson to you this morning and just ask, Lord, that you will be with Carol Sue as she faces different health issues and may she just sense your touch. May she sense your healing. Melissa Pearson, the same way, Lord. May you just watch over her and protect her and keep her safe and bring healing and health to her as well. Lord, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for everything that has already taken place and what is still yet to come, Lord. We give you ourselves, we give you our hearts, we give you everything, Lord. And we ask these things in your name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. God is good, and all the time, amen, amen. Doug normally gets to take the mic, but I did today. Um, I had something planned a little different. Um, I am still going to put this on him. He's probably going to take it off immediately. I at least had to put it on. Um, on a serious note, um, there is nothing more valuable than a person that spends their whole entire life looking out at these faces and calling after God for their hearts. We are all individuals that go through so much crap on a daily basis, and his heart absorbs all that because this is what God called him to do. Um, birthdays are for being thankful for the person. Um, and today this is you and, and we are all so thankful we don't even, we don't even realize how much you do for us, how much you pray for us, how much you think about us on a daily basis. And because we, we all have our own personal lives. Um, 
I haven't been here this long, but you've taught me so much about being meek and humble, and we're so thankful for you. So um, let's give a round of applause. The Westland clap first. <laughs> I normally don't like it. And I just, I desire, uh, if we all just continue to stand, we, we'll pray for him real quick and then let him do what he does. God, oh, sovereign God, you're so amazing and you know what we want. You know what we need at all times. And we are all here this morning, Father God, to sit and to be thankful and to listen to the word that you gave this man to us today, Father, and I just pray that you continue to be with him through his physical health and that you continue to affirm who he is amongst the shepherds. And we just thank you for his life, Father God, and we just lift Pastor Lyle up to you today to just continue to guide his heart, to guide his spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Got you, beat you, Doug. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, if this took place when I turned 45, I don't know what's gonna happen when I turn 46, so. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Uh, now that you did that, you threw me all off. I don't know what I was doing next. Uh, okay, we sang and we prayed and now you sat down. Okay, now, as you came in this morning, I'm assuming all of you got a bulletin if you want to take that out and the back flap tears off. Pastor Lane shows you that week after week. I think you know now to tear that back flap off. Make any prayer requests or praises that you have on that. Place it in the, um, the pew where you're at or put it in the boxes on your way out this morning. This normally is the time where we would take an offering, but we don't do that anymore. As I said, there's boxes at the back of each one of the exits. You can put your offering in there during this song or after the service, however you choose to do that, but that's where we uh, take our offering right now. And I do wanna thank you, because without your, your offering, without your gifts, each and every week, we would not be able to do all the ministries that we do. And the only reason that we are here is to love people to Jesus. I mean, that's why God has put us here. And because of your financial support, whether through the giving right now or through the electronic giving, we're able to do that, and we are so thankful for each and every one of you, and I'm thankful for each and every one of you this morning as well. So before we do anything else, let's go ahead and pray for the offering. And uh, Lord, we just come to you right now. It is a special day, Lord, because you are here with us. And Lord, we, we think of it as a special day because we're able to join together in worship, and we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and you meet with us, and Lord, we're so thankful for that. But I just ask now, Lord, that you would also, as we meet together, that, Lord, that you would help us to be able to hear from you in every part of the service this morning. Lord, I believe that you impress upon us to tithe. It comes from you. And so, Lord, we come to the time in our service where we, we fill out that tithe and we put it all together, and, Lord, we give it to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to multiply that and ask, Lord, that you would help us to be wise stewards in that so that each and every dime, each and every penny is spent for ministry so that we can reach more and more people for Christ. And we just ask these things in your name. And all of God's children said, amen.
put his drinks up here and his, his uh, uh, different electronic devices and then he gets all set. And for me, <laughs> I just have to hobble my way over here with a chair. And so I guess we all have our, our things we have to deal with. But it is great to be with you this morning. It is, it's amazing what God does, it, it's, and sometimes you wonder, what goes through a pastor's mind when, on a Sunday morning? Let me tell you what went through my mind a few minutes ago as we started, when you started coming in for 1030 service. And, and some, uh, some people have mentioned in the last few weeks, it seems like the sanctuary is getting a little fuller, there's more people here, which is, which is true, and we need to give God praise for that. So give him praise for that. But quite honestly, one of the things that always that struck me this morning as I was sitting up here getting ready to do worship and people were coming in, I saw some people that normally you walked in and you say, there's somebody in my seat. There's somebody sitting in my pew. Where, where am I going to sit? Where am I? And, and you may not have said that, but that's what I picked up with your eyes back there. Now, wait a minute, I always sit there and that person's there. Okay, do I go kick him out and say that? No, I'm glad you don't. But it, maybe that's a good thing because we need to remind ourselves that, you know, we need to make sure that we're giving God our best. We need to make sure that we're saying, okay, God, I'm here. Uh, and uh, not saying that you're going to lose your seat if you don't show up on time, but you never know. Uh, I do know the premium seats are still available on the front row. And so uh, if you want those, those, those are still available. But it is great to be with you this morning. Uh, next Sunday, we are having the opportunity to be ministered to by Dr. Jim Lowe. Dr. Lowe has been with us on other occasions, and it's always a joy to have him with us when he's speaking or whether he's leading us in a seminar, whatever it might be. Dr. Lowe is a professor at Indiana Wesleyan. He's going to be retiring. He's uh, sort of semi-retired this year. Uh, he just recently completed 2,000 prayer walks. He gets up at about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning, heads to Indiana Wesleyan. He lives in Anderson. And he walks the campus and he prays not only for everything on the campus, but he goes in and out of the buildings and prays for those. He recently completed 2,000 of those uh, in his time in Indiana Wesleyan. He's, he's a great man, just, uh, just so impressed with him. And he's now is part of a district circuit writer group. It's actually four semi-retired or retired pastors who have taken all the churches in the Crossroad districts and divided them into fourths. And uh, the fourth that he is, we are part of that fourth that Dr. Lowe is a part of. And so he's going to be here next Sunday morning and he's going to be preaching in this service. And, and it, I'm looking forward to him coming. Uh, I always get so much out of his messages and I hope that you are going to be with us next week because you will not want to miss that. Well, this morning we are going to be looking at a scripture passage found in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning and want to go... So, Go ahead and head there. That's great. If you didn't bring your Bible this morning, you want to use one of the pew Bibles in front of you, feel free to do that. Use your electronic device or follow along on the screen, however you choose to do that this morning. But that's where we're going to be, Matthew 16. And Jesus is going to be asking his disciples a very important question in this chapter. And while the question that we're going to look at this morning was directed specifically towards the disciples in our text at that time, the question today still remains for us. It's, it's directed at us now. And I pray that as we leave this morning, you also will be able to answer Jesus' question as the disciples were able to. There was a story told about a young black man. He was fortunate in that he had both parents, but they struggled to make both ends meet like most parents do. But for his birthday that year, they had scraped together enough money to buy him a brand new bicycle. And a few days later, someone stole that bicycle. Enraged, the boy went looking for the thief, and in the process of his search, he encountered a police officer. And the police officer asked him, he said, what are you going to do if you catch the boy who stole your bike? And he said, I don't know. Now, it was obvious to the policeman that if the boy ever did find the person who stole the bike, he might not, might not only lose his bike, but he could be beaten up terribly in any fight that ensued. So he asked the boy, if he'd like to go to the gym with him. 
Well, the boy said, yeah, he said, I would do that. So the police officer took him to the gym, a nearby uh, gym facility, and the policeman began to teach the boy how to box. That boy's name was Cassius Clay. Now, later, he changed his name to Muhammad Ali and became one of the greatest fighters to ever enter the ring. But while Muhammad Ali was similar to many of the other fighters of that time, I mean, he worked out just like they did. He boxed, he sparred, he ran for miles in preparation for every fight. He had one distinguishing difference that gave him the edge whenever he put on the gloves. Ali said, to this day, I never found my bike. But every time I get into the ring, I look across at my opponent and say to myself, that's the guy who stole my bike. And what Ali was saying was this. He had prepared long before he stepped into the ring. He, like other prize fighters, had always prepared for the fights physically for weeks and months ahead of time. But what gave him his cutting edge was this. He had prepared himself mentally long before he ever stepped into the ring. And as we pick up our reading today in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, we, we need to realize a couple of things. Jesus had an, had an earthly ministry with these 12 men for three years. And as we start reading in Matthew 16, the time of that ministry was getting closer to being over. For three years, Jesus had been speaking and mentoring these men so that they would be prepared for a fight that they did not even know was coming yet. And while Jesus had given these guys warnings of trouble coming in the days ahead, they did not understand what was going to be actually happening to them. They would soon be entering a battle that they had never been in before. His disciples knew that they had been being trained by Jesus because Jesus had been working with them for over two years by having them follow him wherever he went. For months, these disciples had listened to Jesus as he taught. They watched him as he healed people, fed the crowds. They had tem trembled as he walked upon the water and stood amazed as Jesus calmed the winds from a storm on the sea. Physically, they had begun to get into shape. But they needed something else. They needed an edge. They needed to be trained in how to think. And what we read about here in Matthew 16 was a critical part of that training, of that thinking. For this session, Jesus takes them out of the familiar world of Galilee and Judea and into an unsettling world just across the border into pagan territory. He takes them to the capital of the Roman province and where the governors were and the ruled the lands and the headquarters of the Roman troops. Caesarea Philippi was the heart of the kind of pagan worship God had always condemned. And that's where Jesus took them to speak to them and ask them these questions he was going to ask them. And join me as we start reading in chapter, thir or chapter 16, verse 13. And this is what it says. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. As Jesus stood there in the town of Caesarea Philippi, he was surrounded by, by numerous idols and pagan symbols and temples that, that populated the region. I mean, there were 14 temples to Baal in that area. There was one to Caesar, and a nearby cave was rumored to have been the birthplace of the Greek god of nature, Pan. This was an unsettling atmosphere for good religious Jews, for this was indeed the gateway to hell. This was where pagan worship took place. 
And Jesus brought them there to ask them this, this very important question. And when Jesus mentioned that the gates of Hades would not be able to overcome the church, it was this type of thinking and belief that he was thinking of when he brought them to this place. Embodied in all those idols and temples was the power of paganism, the wickedness of ungodliness, the dominion of Satan himself. It was a scary and unsettling place for good Jewish men to be. And it's here that Jesus takes his disciples to prepare them mentally for the fight that they're going to have laying ahead of them. It is here in this place that Jesus continues his training of the disciples by asking them this very simple question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And like school children in a classroom, the disciples just began to throw out answers. Some say you're John the Baptist, a teacher you're there. Some who say you're Elijah. Another one raises his hands and said, I heard someone down by the market say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And when we read this scripture, and when you read scripture, does your mind at times allow you to put yourself in the situation that you're reading about? When I read that passage, I can envision the disciples as children jumping up and down and saying, oh, oh, oh I, know, I know the answer to that question. As I visualize this in my mind, I could see Jesus nod in approval and as he saw his disciples warm to the discussion. I can always almost see him smile as, as he then asked the real question that was on his mind. Okay, okay, you, that's who people say I am, but who do you? Who do you say that I am? And his question was really sort of met with silence. I mean, they weren't used to thinking about Jesus in this way. I mean, they had walked with Jesus for some time now. They, he was their constant companion, their teacher, their friend. They worshiped him, but they had never thought about this question. But then Peter, perhaps frustrated by their silence or ignorance, jumps right in. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus pats Peter on the back and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And you almost find yourself thinking, all right, Peter, way to go, buddy. You the man. At least you know what's going on, Peter. At least you understand who Jesus is. At least you're plugged in. You're mentally focused. You're ready for the fight that lies ahead. And at that moment, you think Peter and the disciples are going to be okay. But then Jesus continues on in verse 21. And this is what he says. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, a few minutes before that, we thought that Peter had it all figured out. That he knew exactly what was going on. But now Peter shows that he doesn't really get it either. He doesn't really understand. And he jumps right in again and objects. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Just a few moments earlier, Jesus had complimented Peter, but now he rebukes him, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, and, and you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is telling Peter that unless he changes his thinking, unless Peter changes his thinking, Satan is always going to have the edge. He's telling Peter that right now he's not prepared for the real fight that lies ahead. Now, I've said all of this to introduce you to something we don't often think about. I've retold this story of Peter's confession and rebuke to introduce us to the fact that you and I also, also are called into the very same fight Jesus was preparing his disciples for. And quite honestly, I'm not sure we're ready either 
Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 12. He says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And again, Paul writes to us in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 5. He says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ, Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. And God is telling us there's a fight shaping up, and we need to be ready for that fight. Paul understood this idea of a fight or battle because when he found himself in prison facing imminent execution, he wrote these words in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In other words, Paul is saying, I did my job. I was successful. I competed and I won the battle. Now we understand that there is a battle that we're going to be fighting and we must make sure that we're physically ready for that battle. Some of you have, have gone to church for years. You've attended Bible studies and Sunday school. Some of you have perfect attendance pens from your youth. Some of you can recite all the books in order in the Bible and find a passage you want in a matter of moments. Physically, you may be in great shape. But the question you need to ask yourself now is this. Are you mentally ready? Are you mentally ready? Do you, do you know what you need to know to give you the edge when you enter the fighting ring? Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi for a reason. He wanted them to understand the seriousness of what they were getting into. He wanted them to realize that this wasn't a game. That this was going to be a deadly struggle for the hearts and the minds of mankind. And so he wanted to bring them face to face with the type of evil they would be fighting. Have you, have you ever noticed or come across people that seem to have their heads buried in the sand when it comes to the evil that is going on in this world? Some, some might say we're looking through the, at the world through rose-colored glasses. But Jesus wanted the eyes of his disciples to be open to what they would, what it was going to be like, and that is the same thing that Jesus wants of us today. I find it concerning that for so many years, the sin that is so readily out in the open today was hidden years ago and not spoken of. Today, it's not only out in the open, but it is being publicly acknowledged and championed by a majority of people. What Scripture declares as sin is now being touted as acceptable. And, and I can't believe that God is okay with this. And I'm not sure that you and I are really prepared for the battle that awaits us. Because quite honestly, we have not done a real good job up to now. Jesus did not want his disciples then, and Jesus does not want his children now to live like pagans. He wanted them to see the sin of the world so that they would know what was at stake. He wanted them to realize that they were going to be in a struggle with an ungodly world. And Jesus wants us to understand that we are in a struggle with an ungodly world. A world that doesn't think like we do. A world that doesn't act like we do. A world that is held captive by Satan, by the power of guilt and shame and selfishness. A world that doesn't know God. And it's into that ring, into that arena of struggle and blood that you and I have been called by God to fight in. To fight the good fight. Contend for the faith. You and I have been called by Jesus to change the world around us. At Indiana Wesleyan, each incoming freshman class is required to take a class called World Changers. And the premise behind the class is that we are to realize that God has called us to change the world that we are living in. 
In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us in Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth. What does he mean? Well, it means the world doesn't taste good. It's fouled by the bitterness of sin. You and I are called by God to flavor this world, to change its taste. Matthew 5, 14, he says, you are the light of the world. What does that mean? It means the world is a dark and dismal place, filled with forbidding corners where evil lurks in the shadows, and you and I are called upon to shed the light of Christ into those corners and expose the harshness of wicked men. Are you being the salt? Are we being the light? Because that's part of the fight. You, you and I are called upon by God to make a difference. To storm the very gates of hell itself and take captive those who are bound for hell. We're called to get into the ring and fight the good fight. Now, now I'm here to tell you, if, if you're going to win this fight, if you're going to accomplish what God has called for us to do, then you've got to come to grips with what is at stake. And we need to realize that people may very well go to heaven or hell depending on how they see us conduct ourselves in the ring. When you first became a Christian, maybe you didn't recite this per, per word, but you made a confession, the same kind of confession that Peter made in Caesarea Philippi. Peter says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When you accepted Christ into your life, you said, I believe, you're, I believe you're the Lord, I believe you're my Savior, I believe you're my Redeemer, and I want you into my life. Those are the words that you said. And in fact, the very foundation of your salvation is to realize the realization that this is exactly who Jesus was and is. If you, if you don't understand that, you don't understand that Jesus is your Savior, your Redeemer, your Forgiver, that, then there's not really a salvation story there. You have to accept him for who he is. But now it comes down to, to what does that confession mean to you now? When you made that confession, were you saying you expected to come and sit down and have God meet your every need? Cater to your every whim? Did it mean that you get to sit back and let God be your servant and come to your beck and call? Or when you made that confession, did it mean you wanted to be his champion, the fighter for his cause, that his enemy, Satan, was now your enemy, and that you wanted to step into the ring and fight the good fight, making a difference in this world? In the late 1800s, during the days and leading up to the Great Depression, there was a great evangelist that caught the imagination of so many people. He was known not just as a great speaker, but also as a great baseball player, and his name was Billy Sunday. Now, one could not talk about Billy and his preaching style and say that Billy sat at, an, at a pulpit or Billy sat at a table or Billy stood in the middle of the stage and never moved because Billy Sunday was the type of a speaker who would roam from edge to edge, and many times he'd be down and he'd be up and down the aisle as he's speaking. And he, I mean, he was all over the place pleading with people to understand the power of God and the grace of Christ. And at one time, he slid across the stage as if sliding into home plate to illustrate that becoming a Christian was much like sliding into home and God calling us safe. Speaking on sin one Sunday morning, Billy said, I'm against sin. I'll kick at it as long as I have a foot. I'll fight at it. I'll fight it as long as I have a fist. I'll butt it as long as I have a head. I'll bite it as long as I have a tooth. And when I am old and footless and fistless and toothless, I'll gum it. <laughs> Until I go home to glory and it goes home to perdition. You and I are in a fight. Whether or not we want to accept it or not, whether we want to believe it or not, whether the disciples wanted to believe it or not, when they were standing there in front of Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, there was a fight that they were involved in. And soon after Jesus was gone, they realized what that fight entailed. 
And Jesus is asking them, he asks them right up front, he said, who do people say that I am? Well, they say you're this. And then he turned it right around and he says, who do you say that I am? And I believe that's what God is asking us today, that, that as we come to this message this morning, as, as we prepare and as we sit in this sanctuary this morning, God is saying to you, who do people say that I am? Who do the people around you say that I am? And we probably have all kinds of answers. But then God turns the table and he says, no, 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 let's stop a minute. Who do you say that I am? Because that's what's the most important question. Are you going to be able to fight the battle? Are you prepared to fight? Physically, we may say, yeah, I know scripture. I, I yeah, I know my way around the Bible. I, I know that. Physically, you're saying, yeah. But mentally, are you ready to fight against the things of the world? We have to answer that question in a manner of saying, you are the Christ. You are my Savior. You're my Redeemer. And if we can say that, if that is our answer, then you are not only prepared physically, but you're prepared mentally for the fight that is coming. And I use the word coming, and I shouldn't use that word. I should use the word here. Because the fight is here now. It's not something that we can say, well, you know, in 10 years down the road, we'll, we'll, we'll think about that. No, it's here right now. The fight is here. Are you in the ring fighting? Are you standing outside saying, yeah, I'll let them fight the fight, but I'll stay out here. Are you ready to fight? Because that's what the question means. If we believe that God is who he says he is, if we believe that God is our Redeemer, our Savior, our, our Lord, our Savior, then we're ready for the fight. And I pray that all of us are ready for the fight because it's here. Will you stand with me, please? Lord, I realize that the message this morning could be viewed as a battle call, and, and I'm okay with that because I believe that's exactly where we're at. Lord, there's so many things going on in our world today, so many things that are taking place that are sin. They're sinful, Lord. I mean, it, it, it's just the way it is. And we know that they're not supposed to be here. We know, the Lord, that you want us to fight against those. And, Lord, quite honestly, some of those things that are in the world today are because people before us may not have fought as, fight as, as, fought as, as much as they should have. And so, Lord, I, I believe you come to our generation, our group, Lord, and you say, okay, will you stand up and fight? Will you be ready for the battle? And Lord, I, I pray that we will all be able to, to answer the question that you ask us, who do you say I am? Lord, in a manner that you know that we're ready. And Lord, you'll give us the strength. You will give us everything we need in order to fight this battle. And Lord, realizing that how we fight in this battle, how we fight inside of this ring of, Lord, will may cause some people to either accept you or reject you. Lord, I believe that you have called all of us to be your children. And I believe, Lord, that you will equip all of us to fight the battle. It really comes down to whether or not we want to fight it or not. 
And so, Lord, I pray in the, in, as we close this service that each and every one of these people who are here in the sanctuary this morning or those who are watching online will have already made up their mind that I'm ready to fight the battle. Wherever it takes me, whatever, whatever needs to be done, I'm ready to fight. And, Lord, I pray that, that you will help us in these battles. And, Lord, that you will walk with each and every one of us. And we will be able to say, as Paul did in 2 Timothy, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Lord, I pray now that you would release us with your benediction and your blessing. The Lord, as we go out into the world this week, we realize that there are going to be opportunities uh, that come upon each and every one of us at different times to be able to fight the battle. And I pray, Lord, that we will be... I pray, Lord, that we will be in that battle and Lord that you will be right there along with us fighting with us step by step we just now ask that you would release us with your benediction and your blessing and give all of you and give you Lord all of our glory and all of our hearts and our lives this day and we ask these things in your name and all of God's children said amen amen You are dismissed. Have a great week. God bless.